Uh, I want to introduce you to our um, facilitators today, uh, Leanne Sullivan, who was recently promoted to be the regional manager of the um, Massachusetts office, and Ian Jabril, uh, who is a division manager and manages the largest uh, uh, volunteers in the PD Green program from Princeton University. So I put you in the hands of, of Ian and Lynn, and then they will introduce our panelists. Uh, thank you for that, Mako. Uh, as Mako mentioned, my name is Ian Jabril. Um, I am the division manager in New Jersey. Uh, I work primarily with Princeton University students out of Garden State Youth Correctional Facility. I myself was able to benefit from um, education while incarcerated. I enrolled in some college courses while in Mountain View Youth Correctional Facility. Upon my release, I was accepted in and enrolled in Rutgers University to which I eventually uh, completed with my bachelor's. Um, I have been with PD Green now, um, approaching three years and I am extremely excited about the work we're doing moving forward. Hi, I'm Lynn Sullivan, the new region manager of Massachusetts. I also have gotten my education through the prison education program of Boston University while incarcerated. I've got a degree in sociology of science and I am now enrolled in the criminal justice program that they have for graduate students. I work mainly with Tufts University and Harvard University and I have approximately seven different prisons, jails, and detention centers that we work with here in Massachusetts. We build strong leadership teams on our universities. And it's, it's a pleasure to be here and be a part of the Peter Green program and continue education and trying to get education for everyone to have access to. Okay, and to begin with our panelists, Terrell A. Blunt is a motivational speaker and mentor of justice-involved people, as well as an activist for justice reform. He is known for speaking on increasing or creating pathways to higher education for currently and formerly incarcerated individuals, reentry needs for people leaving prison, and public policies that affect the population. Founder and the founding director of the formerly incarcerated college graduates network serves as a board of trustee of the PD Green program and an advisory board member for the prison teaching initiative. He is, he is the co-founder of the Supportive Housing for Adults in Reentry, a nonprofit to liberate formerly incarcerated people through financial literacy and home ownership. Robbie Farouk Weidman is a returning citizen who spent 44 years in Pennsylvania prisons. Mr. Wyman gained an associate degree in technical, technical engineering from CCAC and has earned over 20 credits from the University of Pittsburgh. For 17 years, Mr. Wyman taught algebra and trigonometry for the University of Pittsburgh inside of the infamous Western Penitentiary, also known as the Wall. Mr. Wyman collaborated with his brother, noted author, John Edgar Wideman in writing the prize-winning memoir, Brothers and Keepers. Wideman is also one of the authors who wrote the Hognet New Book from the Ellisnor Benu Think Tank for restorative justice titled Life Sentences, writing from inside an American prison. Mr. Wideman was the first lifer in over 25 years in Western Pennsylvania to have his life sentence commuted. Hello. <clears throat> uh, Lynn, you want to do Stacy? I'll do Stacy. Uh, Stacy Borden. Master I'm sorry, I was muted. <laughs> oh, okay. So Stacy Borden. She has a master's degree in mental health counseling with a concentration in addiction and trauma. She is the founder and president of New Beginnings Reentry Service. Stacy is an author, performance artist a motivational speaker, and an activist. She has been on several panel discussions about the criminal justice system and on how the prison system and mass incarceration has impacted families and families of color and women. Stacey has also been a guest lecturer at Berkeley College of Music, and her story inspires students to do their final project on mass incarceration. Stacey is a prominent 
proponent of drama therapy with an empathetic value and the individual suffering from trauma and addiction. She is currently a board member with the OWLL, On With Living and Learning Productions, a nonprofit organization. The OWLL works with formerly incarcerated women and dynamic workshops that incorporate reading, writing, storytelling, active listening to build imperative life skills and job skills. Through storytelling, they work through challenging past, creating art that is healing for the individual while building self-esteem and developing skills that will enable success re-entry into society. Stacy is also a board member with Families for Justice as Healing, an organization by and for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women and girls and women with loved ones who are incarcerated. They are working to end the incarceration of women and girls. Stacy Boyd, formerly incarcerated, is a member of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls and a member of the NADAC, the Association for Addiction Professionals. Thank you, Stacy, for being here today. Okay, so uh, starting with Stacy, can you introduce yourselves uh, to the audience? More specifically, how do you exist in this world today? And talk briefly about how you participated in educational programs while you were incarcerated. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you for having me. This is an honor. Um, my name is Stacy Borden. Again, I am formerly incarcerated. I'm a member, I'd be remiss if I didn't speak about Andrea James, who's the founder of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls, who's my mentor and board member for Families for Justice as Healing, which is right in the Roxbury community uh, of Boston. I'm also a board member of OWL Productions, which as Lynn said, that we perform um, theater. We take women's stories, um, stress stories, women have been incarcerated, homeless, addicted, suffered from trauma, sexual abuse, domestic violence, and we bring their stories and their voices to the stage as part of healing uh, in the form of art to counter the trauma that they've endured before prison, while in prison, and after prison because there hasn't been any resources available. So to answer the question, um, Ian, that I probably forgot, by now, since I had that long introduction. <laughs> Just kind of um, describe how you participated in educational programs while you were incarcerated. How you began <laughs> and then uh, the struggles you faced while inside, the struggles you faced after your release, you know, as briefly as possible. So to be brief, brief it was um it was a struggle um the way legislation set up these policies for educational purposes at the time that i was in and out i've been in and out of prison for the past 30 years suffering from my own trauma and addictions and it wasn't until probably 2003 that lynn and angie jefferson and my cellmate Kimia faust whom i'm always going to lift up their names because i left them behind um, gave me the idea that I probably should sign up for some services and get some help. Well, there was minimal help for my mental illness incarcerated, being in prison. Um, so I was led into taking courses on victims of violence, um, substance abuse issues, did the CRA program, and I didn't feel like that was enough. I, I, I was in pain and I was in search of while I was in so much pain. When we talk about pain, we don't really know what we're talking about. Do we feel pain in my arm? Do I feel the pain in my heart? Like, where's the pain at? And what am I describing? What does pain look like? And it wasn't until I, again, saw Lynn up in the institution and her and Samantha guided me into the BU program. Well, I didn't have enough time. I was serving the last three-year sentence, and you had to have, I think, five years in order to go for a degree program. But the sisters in there fought for me, and um, the superintendent overrode it, or somebody overrode it and allowed me to take courses without getting credit. That was a plus to me because I was able to really learn what I was reading. I used to always think that I had a problem with comprehension. And it was, I only found out later that I just suffered so much trauma that I didn't have the time to sit there and try to read and figure out what I was trying to read. And my mind was just in the dark place of trauma. And so I learned that I, I needed to read. I could read 
what was interest of me and what was interested to me was learning about my brain. Why was I going through so much darkness and trauma and continuously wanting to get high? I didn't know I was getting high to numb. I thought I was getting high to get high. But I learned some stuff. And when I really started learning how to articulate what I was feeling, it was in the writing area with BU. The teachers came in and taught me how to write and articulate my stories, coming from the perspective of the death of my sister, who I couldn't really handle too well at that time, and being able to just write the story and find the real purpose of what sisterhood and meaning of family unit was really about. After I read her story of what we went through, it was almost like a hammer moment that I was able to really see that there was more happiness than sadness. And I, something happened. I always say that it was like I, the educational process gave me a, 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 a little, like I was a little chicken with an egg being hatched. And I seen the world different. And I just had a thirst to learn from there. And that was my journey. When I came out of prison in 2010, I went straight into college. And six years of education gave me a whole different perspective of what my life and meaning and morals and values was about. And so I haven't stopped that journey. I think education is meaningful and purposeful. And I think that incarcerated people, non-incarcerated people, formerly incarcerated people, we need education. And so I'm really grateful for PD Greens. I'm, I'm doubly grateful for them extending the services to outside of the prison for formerly incarcerated people with my turn. So um, I hope that answered that question, Ian. I could go on and on as yeah. you talk. Yeah, you <laughs> answered that question and, and a few more as well. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I'll send this question to you, Terrell. Um, again, uh, introduce yourself brief, briefly and how do you exist in this world today uh, and talk briefly about how you participated in educational programs while you were incarcerated. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Awesome. So um, yeah, my name's Terrell Blunt. Uh, I currently serve in about four different <laughs> roles. Uh, I work at the Laughing Gold Foundation um, as a program officer of higher education in prison. I also serve as the director of the Formerly Incarcerated College Graduates Network, which is a nonprofit where we support and uplift um, directly impacted people uh, who have attained their college degree, as well as lifting up the voices of those who uh, wish to attain uh, college education and you know pursue you know career opportunities. So, um, in those two spaces, I I think answers the question of um, how I exist uh, today, or at least the roles that I exist in. Um, my experience is on the inside with education. Um, really, wasn't uh, as meaningful as my experience with education on the outside. And the reason I say that is because of the uh, prison system in New Jersey and many other states uh, across the country, you know, um, you're, you're, you're essentially, you know, labeled and you have, you're given a number and, um, you know, essentially warehoused. And uh, just like products are shipped um, from facility to facility, and warehouse to warehouse and Amazon and Wayfair and whatever other, you know, shipping um, services you want to uh, talk about. It's essentially the same way in the prison system, especially at the federal level as well, uh, which I do not have any, um, you know, experience in being incarcerated. But, um, you know, I think due to that being shipped around from place to place uh, with no, you know, warning, you're just called, uh, that interrupted my uh, college experience on the inside um, at least three different times. And uh, due to the program not having someone in place, like a coordinator that maybe worked for the college um, or, or someone, even if it was uh, an incarcerated person that, you know, worked for the, the school area specifically for the college program, there was none of that. And um, when I would wind up missing from class, the professor most of the time 
didn't have any type of, you know, uh, connection with the students. Um, they would just assume that I stopped coming. And, you know, I don't blame them because there were a handful of guys that would just stop coming to class after the second week or third week or maybe halfway through the semester. Um, and if there wasn't a classmate to tell them that, you know, um, that Terrell was uh, shipped out to another prison or whatever the case, uh, I wouldn't receive a withdrawal. I would get an F um, in a lot of the classes. And, um, you know, just even if that wasn't the case, if I was getting withdrawals or, you know, um, if the situations were, you know, being rectified, I think just the constant um, disruptions in my education uh, just really um, – wasn't helpful toward you know my transformation in the way that uh i would like it i would have liked it um to have been but it was enough for me to want to pursue when i returned home and um it was at that point when i was in the halfway house and uh had maybe about a year a little over a year left uh to serve in the halfway house is when i looked into going to Rutgers. Um, which is something that I was often say when I was incarcerated, when I was downstate. And I remember guys like, you know, laughing at me and saying that, um, and saying that I wouldn't, uh, you know, be able to achieve what I was telling them I wanted to achieve and, and go to college and all of that. And um, I made it happen. Uh, and it was through, you know, a number of individuals uh, who assisted me in applying and um, helping me with like my, my statement and everything and, um, you know, just continuing to persist and make it through, you know, the, uh, the programs that I enrolled in. I'm here today serving in a number of uh, roles and positions to uh, keep the door open for other directly impacted people who wish to, you know, achieve um, education inside or after uh, prison. Uh, thank you for that, Terrell. Um, yeah, we extend this question to you, Farouk. Um, don't forget to take yourself off mute as well. Uh, how do you exist in this world today and talk briefly about how you participated in educational programs while you were incarcerated? Well, uh, my, my story is so much longer. <laughs> You know, I went to prison, you know, yeah, 1976. And, uh, you know, when I first went to prison, I had no idea of going to any kind of college programs or school programs. I had already had a high school degree. But, uh, you know, I had broke the heart of my mother for so many years that she kept telling me, you know, boy, you going to school in there, boy? And so, you know, she actually talked me into something I didn't want to do. Uh, but, you know, again, she told me the right thing, and she always did. And I started classes. Mm, I think it was like around 1978. And uh, I had the high school de degree, and so I started in with the engineering program at CCAC. And I can remember, as Terrell said, like I used to have a big drafting board. You know, this is pre-computers almost. I mean, there were computers, but they were great big monstrosities. We didn't have no laptops or none of that. And so we were still drafting on great big boards. And I used to have to come out of the block with that thing and guys would laugh, and, you know, talk stuff on me, you know, and I was, you know, still using, but trying to make a change in my life. And, uh, you know, so education was extremely important in me beginning to make a change in my world. Uh, that change would take time. The, the programs that they had for us back then were not easily to get into in the prison. And, uh, you know, so it took me a while to get into community college. I did a couple classes with Pitt. But once they finally started the community college program and I got into engineering, uh, I guess it was around 80 by then. And, uh, you know, 
one of the things that I found out was the guys who got education and got college degrees didn't come back to prison, which was a great incentive. Uh, but I was still hung up on being a part of the streets. I was still hung up on a lot of things. What education did for me, you know, taught me that I could be more than I'd been. You know, new knowledge always creates something new in us if we let it. You know, we can't unlearn what we learn. And until we learn new things, we can never be, we can't change. And I started seeing the change that it made in other people. And I began to work harder and harder. Uh, I was blessed that when I started, I seen that I still could learn. All the years of drugs and alcohol hadn't uh, destroyed my brain cells. And all the years of trying to be a gangster hadn't, uh, you know, changed me drastically enough that I couldn't still learn. And so I began to learn. I began to enjoy it. I began to study. I would sit up and, you know, the, when I started taking algebra and trigonometry classes, I can remember word problems that I would go to sleep with the books in my chest. And, uh, you know, that kind of learning and waking up in the morning, uh, knowing the answer to the problem that I couldn't figure out until I slept on it or slept with the book in my chest was so rewarding to, uh, to where it just made me hungry. You know, uh, I tell the story, there was a time in between that I went to the whole uh, trying to escape. I was a lifer. I tried to leave out of the back door. Didn't make it. But I had books, boxes of books sent to me by my brother. He was mentioned earlier. And, you know, sometimes being in that hole was like a monastery. I studied and learned and studied and learned. And that's why I appreciate Pete Green so much. Because they're giving the men the one thing that will really change their world. And that is an education. Like I said a minute ago, men to get college degrees in prison do not go back to prison. And you know, that is the great reward. And so after I finally graduated, <coughs> excuse me, I began, Pitt asked me to teach classes. I learned more by teaching than I did by learning and reading and studying. Giving it away is greater than getting it. You know, and uh, learning to give away the knowledge that I got was my greatest reward. And we're talking, all these things happened over 45 years. I taught for 17 of those years. The worst thing I seen in prison, one of the worst days is when they closed down the college programs, took away the Pell Grants, threw away all the computers that we had then. I, we had finally got computers and we're talking all the way back to when database was like the only language and I was just learning that we had floppy disk and they closed down the college program, threw away the books, threw away the computers. It was one of the darkest days that I remember. And you know, there were some dark days over 44 years in prison, but I'll never forget that. And so what I do now, uh, you know, now that I'm out, there's no way I could briefly tell you about 44 years. You can ask questions, folks, if they want to later. But what I do now is I, uh, I work with the think tank that you mentioned from Duquesne University. They came in and started an inside out program. Eventually we started a, a inside out think tank. That think tank is the Elsinore venue think tank. And with that think tank, we created something that's called Inside Out with Police, where an Inside Out is a program where college students come in and learn and have classes with uh, the brothers in the joint. And so we started it with police. We wanted to start it with all people in uh, the justice system. 
judges, district attorneys. We didn't get that far yet. But uh, we did start this, and the difference that it made, now they're doing it with cadets here in Pittsburgh. Uh, from And they have to have, go into prison and have classes with guys in prison. And it changed these folks. They learned something. You know, there's no way we can change the world unless we do it collectively. And so, you know, we had to go through a lot of stuff to get that program started. And so now I still take part in the think tank. I do a lot of speaking. I'm involved in a lot of things. The pandemic has slowed everything down, like I'm sure everybody understands. But, uh, you know, I make my living by speaking. Uh, I actually work for the Urban League here in Pittsburgh. And uh, we do food distribution to elderly folks in high rises all over the city since the pandemic started. We're trying to build a halfway house here in Pittsburgh, similar to, uh, you know, the big one they have up in New York City. Uh, so, you know, that's how I sustain myself out here in the world. Uh, I'm still trying to help people. And I'll just say this and finish is that I learned a long time ago, being a part of, you know, Narcotics Anonymous, that the... Uh, the greatest thing you can do for yourself is to help someone else. And so I learned to help other people. And that is how I make, I'm making a living, trying to help other people and sustaining my spirit, my mind, my life is dedicated to trying to uh, make life better for, you know, folks like me, still trying to help a lot of men get out. And, you know, elders, you know, we're getting ready to do a kids program. We're doing a lot of things. And uh, so it's all about helping the next one. And that's why I really appreciate what Peter Green does. Thank you. Glad to hear that. <laughs> awesome. So for, but this is a question for all of you. You all can chime in, maybe have a conversation. Uh, so Peter Green program supports education inside jails, and prisons, and detention centers. This fall, we began supporting educational programs associated with reentry programs. Although we work with formal educational programs, we know that you're all, we, so we, we know that education is always happening in confined settings, so that we know that you're all in participated in the educational programs on the inside, but I think it's important to understand how you even define education and what types of education and knowledge sharing occur in prisons and jails outside of the formal programming. That's for anybody. You can hop in. All of you. Anyone want to take a shot at that one? <laughs> well, yeah. I'll say this. Okay, go ahead, Terrell. Yeah, I, I was going to say, um, you know, you do have, of course, formal education that could come from a outside entity, whether it's a college, a nonprofit, um, volunteer program, whatever that looks like. People are coming in and um, you know, providing some type of educational service in which uh, you know, the students may or may not wind up with the credential, credits, uh, certificate of participation, whatever that looks like. But if, it, if it's you know, people gathering with an instructor in front of those uh, students or that group, um, that's essentially like a formal setting, right? Um, and is, is a method or, uh, you know, approach to education. But I think um, also, and the panelists uh, will probably, you know, agree with me, even if programs, you know, uh, did not come inside of the prisons, um, I think there's, you know, groups of incarcerated people that still build and, and, and teach one another and you, you, you share information. Um, now, is it running rampant throughout the prison system? Um, it, it probably isn't, um, but you know, you have individuals that do some heavy reading um, and expose you to some, some books and some information. And when you start to learn about the books that are banned from entering prisons and you think about the reasons why, uh, it just makes you think even more how, uh, you know, punitive the system is, not just from a matter of handing out sentences, but all the way down to 
you know, what type of information they want you receiving because, you know, uh, too much good information that is empowering and uplifting and uh, gets you to think differently, that's a threat to the status quo. It's a threat to their system, and they don't want that. Um, and they probably much rather have the NAAA, you know, groups um, come in and, you know, the college programs, probably less, a little less, uh, you know, happy about that. But still, they rather that than us as a, as a group of people who don't know one another prior to coming into this place. But we starting to form bonds and, and grow and learn together. That's the last thing they want. But um, to the question of how education can also manifest inside of the prison system, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. And I, I'd also say, secondly, I used to have this in my bio some years back, um, but my journey actually started with me uh, working in the school area. I was a TA. I would sit in the class and, you know, kind of uh, run errands for the, the teachers in the school area. I would work in the office filing papers and stuff like that for the administrative, um, you know, workers in there. And um, I started, when I would come back to the tier, I started, um, you know, helping men on the tier uh, study for their GED and high school diploma. And um, it came just from one one guy, you know, walking up to me one day. I was reading, I think, a thesaurus. <laughs> and um, he walked up and was like, oh, you work in the school area, right? And I was like, yeah. He was like, yo, I'm trying to pass this math. Um, can you help me out with it? And I, I automatically, like, got shook up because um, I've never been that great in math. And, you know, prior to incarceration, I just viewed myself as someone who was less than um, because of, you know, the grades I would get in, in school. And, you know, I just viewed myself as a poor student. But um, when I looked at the math and I saw that it was something that I knew since, like, sixth grade, um, and then the reading that a lot of the men uh, were doing in there and the, the reading levels that they were at, it just organically formed where it was like seven to eight of us uh, just meeting weekly, um, you know, at night when the, the lights would uh, go out and it would just be like this small like emergency lights. We would still be up at the crack of dawn just going over things. And I, I was kind of acting as the facilitator or the teacher, you know, um, just helping folks uh, pass their tests and stuff like that. So that's another way that, uh, you know, I thought was a little important because it shows like the leadership um, part that a lot of people wind up taking, um, you know, unintentionally uh, inside the system. Thank you. Anyone else have anything to add? Yeah, that was so well said, Terrell. Look at our young people, right? I don't even think I could articulate it <laughs> any way like that. But, you know, I, I have to say, as much as I love Petey Green and I love the process of education, I'm an abolitionist. We really prefer no entry, but being that there is prisons and we have people in prisons, I decided to try to assist women coming out of prison. But to say that prison is so punitive and punishing, when you go in with trauma, how could you ever think that you're going to get any education in there? So thank God for Petey Green and the patience of the volunteers and the professors that come in. But really, when you finish that course and going up in Framingham, we have the institution, and you're coming back into population, and you got to make your way back to the cell and try to do homework and try to, you know, it's a lot. So I'm all for, I'm all for outside of prison. Formerly incarcerated people with my turn with PD Green setting up. It's phenomenal. I think it is beautiful. I think it works. And I and I just want to be clear, like I'm I'm not an advocate. It's almost sounding like an advertisement to go into prison, get education. The only way we can turn the black and brown communities around is to go in prison and get an education. No. no. That's not what we're talking about. And so Again, I'm an abolitionist. We don't believe in prisons. We are aiming with the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls and Families for Justice is Healing to end incarceration of women and girls. And so this is right on time with what PD Green is doing with my turn and partnering with community centers to help formerly incarcerated people overcome the challenges of 
fear of being educated. Terrell said it, like how, you know, sometimes we can't even focus on the math that they have to make. I can't help my nieces with that. I don't have a clue. Like, what what do they learn? And everything changes so fast. It's probably called aging. But, you know, you got to keep up with this stuff. And how do you do that is part of reimagining communities is really getting community centers, getting Boston public schools, colleges involved in community centers to bring these type of efforts for former incarcerated people to know that they could make that effort you know, really transform themselves and say, you know, I, I need my GED. I would like to be educated. I would like to go to college. What does education really mean? We've been educated for years going in and out of the penitentiary. We've been educated, as Robert said, just being in the street. It's an education in itself. Now, how do we put that two together and really look at ourselves and say, I have this education what can you teach me now and allow me to be transformed and allow me to really target my, my harm, the harm that's been caused to me, the harm that I've caused to others, and really sit with myself and give back to my community educationally. And so I don't know if that answers that question, but that's my take on it. Uh, thank you for that, Stacey. Um, so let, let me jump into this question uh, for you, Mr. Farouk. Um, we noticed that prison education is a hot topic right now. We even witnessed uh, the PBS broadcast of a documentary called College Behind Bars. I highly recommend it for those of you who have not seen it. Um, there are also many educational programs across the nation, prison education associations, and a conversation has begun in con Congress about expanding the access to Pell Grants. Of course, we know prison education is not some new concept. Um, Farouk, what I understand, you experienced education on the inside before and after the elimination of Pell Grants, and you also had the opportunity to teach courses for the University of Pittsburgh. Can you take, can you talk a little bit about the various changes you witnessed um, in prison education during your time? Well, early on, as I said, there was, uh, you know, it was a good education system. We had uh, the University of Pittsburgh come in and other prisons around the state, uh, like Graterford had Temple coming in. And, you know, there we had a real good thing going on. Guys, even lifers, were going out to the university themselves and getting taught. But so many things changed. So many things changed over the decades that I spent in prison. And we went from trying to rehabilitate people, and I, when I say we, I'm talking about us as a country, to thinking that it was a waste of time and a waste of money. There was a time in the late 70s, early 80s, when they were talking about rehabilitation didn't work. It was just about punishment. Really, this was more towards the end of the, I mean, the beginning of the 80s, I should say. And so they took all the education away. Uh, the only education you could get was uh, basically a GED. And, you know, they weren't even forcing people to do that. Uh, we protested. We had our people on the outside protesting. Back then we had NAACP groups in the prison. You know, we had them lobbying, trying to get the education back. Uh, it slowly came back when, you know, ACC, uh, Allegheny Community College, decided to come in for free. And then Pitt came back in for free. And then they wanted to charge men $50. And uh, back then, you know, $50 every semester was a lot of money for guys that were making like $0.32 cent an hour back then and were trying to take care of themselves. So prison education became limited. But as Terrell said, we read a lot of books. You know, I don't know how many hundreds of books I've read in prison, but a lot of books. You know, we did have a decent library. I worked in the library years later. And, you know, so I was an avid reader. And there was a bunch of guys that read even more than me did. We, I did it. 
you know, bought books and passed them around. When I first came to jail, you know, guys handed me books that I had never heard of before about politics, about prisons, uh, you know, all kind of books. And, uh, you know, so that was how we got educated for a while. As I told you, I was there when they took the Pell Grants back and closed, uh, you know, the college system down. And it, it was just a horrible moment to, at that time to know that the only thing that was really keeping people were out of prison, I mean, really keeping them out of prison, was getting education, was learning some new things. You know, if we can't, if we don't learn something new, we can't do anything new, you know, without learning. And the sad truth is that what men learned in the penitentiary most times was how to be better criminals, was how to sell more drugs, you know, was how to abuse women. And I don't mean physical abuse, but, you know, guys wanted to learn how to be players. and uh, You know, everything that most folks learned was negative. And... That was the way of prison. And I think it was Terrell that mentioned that, you know, they, the folks in charge were all right with that. Were all right with that. And not as all right with the guys that were in the groups talking about, uh, especially back then in the early 70s, about, you know, reading Malcolm X's books and, uh, you know, whatever it was that we would read. We would share those books and talk about them in groups. And, you know, that was something that was pushed to the side, you know, but we kept at it. We got more and more educated folks. I know some friends of mine that have just have gotten out after 30 years or so also that are, you know, like almost geniuses from all the stuff that we read. So education in there was something you had to strive for. You had to strive for it. And the sad truth is that now in Pennsylvania, there's less than it was. The good news is now they're talking about making change. And here in Pittsburgh, I'm trying to, we're trying to do what we can through the uh, Duquesne University, through Pitt University, through the think tank I belong in to. Uh, we're trying to do some things. We created that think tank with six lifers in the penitentiary. You know, it's the, the, the thing tank is about restorative justice. We didn't think we'd ever get out of prison, all six of us doing life, but we wanted to create something that we could send ideas out to the world to try to change life for people out here to, you know, where we're not getting justice, to restore justice in people's lives and in our culture and in our education system and in our views of prison and the way people are sent to prison and the amount of time they were sent to prison. We had huge ideas that seemed almost impossible. But when they brought Duquesne University in and we started to get education again and started to be able to take classes with students, uh, it made a huge difference. We started to create the think tank. It spread out to the world. That think tank now is full of college professors, uh, FBI agents, uh, prosecutors, uh, returning citizens, uh, people from different social organizations, uh, you name it. Every kind of people, person that you can think of now belongs to this think tank. And we're making huge, you know, strides on trying to change this city and change how many people can get out of prison. Uh, they stay, well, before the pandemic, they started letting lifers out. I was the first one, but others were coming right behind me. That's been closed down because of the pandemic, but- Ruth, uh, you're doing amazing things, things. hopefully get better. Excuse me? I said you're doing amazing I mean, things. In a, in a time crunch, we'd like to make sure we can hit everybody. So we have a couple okay. more questions we'd like to try to get through and maybe open up for the audience so they can maybe reach okay. in. But thank you so much for everything. Stacey, this question's for you. So in April, we hosted a webinar titled Black Women in Mass Incarceration. 
we will explore the criminalization of Black women and the experiences of incarcerated Black women. We hosted this webinar because the conversation about mass incarceration and state-sanctioned violence almost exclusively focuses on Black boys and men. But Black girls and women are also criminalized and victims of mass imprisonment. Women are also largely left out of the prison education conversation and often have fewer opportunities for education while incarcerated. Now, you've talked about some of the challenges that you face while during incarceration, but what are some of those challenges at post-release? And can you tell us what we need to do to make sure that incarcerated women have access to education during and after prison? Yeah, it's so heartbreaking when you, um, when you read that, Lynn. You know, the whole time I was in prison, I couldn't understand how come we were incarcerated at such a high rate? I mean, women, black women are buried in the prisons. I know. Buried. I mean, you know, we know the disproportionate sentencing guys that they do. Women are serving natural life sentences in the federal system for life for marijuana, right? They never come home. And when you think about that, Who's motivated to get any education when you think you're just, your life is just doomed? How do we even go in and target and get them motivated to say, hey, we have, you know, PD Green, Boston University is coming in, we're going to help you. And they're like, for what? I'm in here and people out there are selling marijuana in dispensaries and I'm still in here and you want me to get educated to do what? We're saying release our women. Release our women out of prison. When we create these reentry programs and these transitional homes, we're saying we can do better by our community, by our women. Release our women. And we can bring them into the world. We can give them the services that they need and help them be motivated enough to want to have an education. You know, we have women that have been um, going in the prison system let me just bring in Kim LaFouse, for instance, who is my best friend, who, you know, was arrested for a crime and really trying to save her life after um, a gentleman coming after her to assault her sexually. And she saved herself with stabbing him with a butter knife. She got 19 to 20 years. That means you have to do 19 before you even see the parole board and you have a year left. You know, how motivated is that? after she was raped at 12 years old and being in the Suffolk County DA's office as a victim and 20 years later, now you're a defendant. How do we get her? She's just now coming out of that trauma. Just, and, and that left her 10 years ago. So she's in her, going into her 15th year, just now getting into the VU program because she just couldn't process what happened to her because they don't have any additional services. I'm a firm believer in treatment. I'm a firm believer in mental health counseling and substance abuse counseling and really targeting the trauma. You can't think about education without removing yourself and healing from the trauma first. You can't even Absolutely. deal with the trauma until you deal with the substance abuse. You have to remove yourself from the substance abuse, target the mental health and go for education. <laughs> That's where Kimia is at. And when we talk about post pre-conviction sentences, post-sentences, we need education. We need services in our community. And so, again, I'm grateful to PD Green. I'm grateful to Boston College. I'm grateful to the universities. We partnered with Berkeley School of Music for Art Therapy. We partnered now with uh, Professor Hinda with uh, My Turn for Women Coming Out of Prison to get some education and P.D. Green is offering free courses and giving them credit. That's huge. That's huge. We're going to start having some credit courses so they can use it toward their degree programs and motivate them. Can you imagine a woman coming out of prison after 20 years, a black woman, and knowing that she has an opportunity to get a master's degree? That has been unheard of. And we're saying, this is the time. It's heard of. I have one, you are educated, you have your degree, and we can continue to do this across the board, federally, state, and city. I don't know if I answered that question, but that's our aim, that's my whole passion. This is my whole life of really helping women become educated and know that they don't deserve to be in a cage. 
Women Amen to that. Men don't belong in cages. And we're going to stop that idea and perpetuating the idea of crime and punishment and move toward rehabilitation, restorative justice, and transform harm. Thank you for that, Stacey. I really appreciate that. I want to bring Terrell into this. Um, in the last decade, prison reform and prison prohibition <laughs> movements have become part of the national conversation. But it's not always clear where prison education fits within, within, within either the prison reform or prison abolition movements. Where do you think prison education fits? I think prison education uh, fits square in the, in the middle of it all. Um, I feel like with education, especially those formal um, education programs that we spoke about, um, you have a two-way or like bi-directional um, exchange of, it, of education. So incarcerated learners are, you know, learning from uh, the professors, the uh, staff that come in, um, the tutors that come in. But then those same individuals that are coming into the facilities are also learning, not in a formal way, but a very informal way through the human interaction um with incarcerated learners and that's when they really get to see from the moment they you know park the car and start coming into the facility and they get to observe uh you know how the offices speak to incarcerated people they may get to see the conditions of the prison um they may get to hear stories from incarcerated students that's the way that they learn and the more you learn about those things the the less able you are to allow your cognitive dissonance to, to block it out. You're going to start saying like, oh, something has to be done about this. Like, this is, this is crazy. And I feel like the more that happens, the more volunteers that we have coming into the facilities, the more programs that we have coming into the facilities, um, the more exposure of the ills of incarceration is what people are going to see and hopefully wake up to and see that this isn't right. Because I, I honestly believe that um, this should be, uh, you know, focused on through a racial justice lens. Um, because we all know, or most of us know, um, how incarceration, you know, even came to be. How police came to be from, you know, uh, uh, slave patrols. And that's why we populate the system so much so to you know I, I i'm all about um reform to work toward abolishment <laughs> as long as prisons exist i feel like you know to say that it's it's all or nothing like shut it down or i'm gonna stay away from it like no as long as this stuff exists i'm gonna continue to make the conditions of confinement better for people that are in there but make no mistake about it incarceration should not exist there's other ways to help people um, who run into situations, issues, whatever you want to call it, it's other ways to, to um, you know, kind of like remedy those, those issues. We shouldn't be locking people up for the rest of their lives for 30 years, for 15 years. It's a girl right now in Michigan that's going by the name of Grace to protect her, you know, her um, identity because she is a minor, but 15 year old uh, black girl that is that um was put into a facility for not attending like an online class as a part of her probation but granted um you know breaking the the terms of probation which again is just another way to keep us locked into the system because once you don't go through and get a job or you don't enroll in school or you don't attend the class they find another way to punish you and um i guarantee if Grace was in white skin, it would not happen. It would, it just wouldn't happen. But um, again, this is this is what we're we're currently in. This is the system that uh, we all have to try to work with in order to reach those powerful men and women and uh, young women such as Grace. We need to create these programs, and we have to work within the system that we don't agree with. So as long as you you know understand that. Uh, which is what I've had to come to realize, like, because I used to stay away and say that I didn't want anything to do with the system because I don't agree with it. 
I, I understood that I would be doing a disservice to those who I want to reach. So um, I absolutely believe, you know, at the intersection of justice, race, and education, um, when you look at it all, abolishment should definitely be <laughs> at the top of the list. Prisons should not exist. And yes, Black lives do matter. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I think next we'd like to sort of open it up for everybody else to um, ask some questions from the audience. Well, cool. thanks, Lynn. I'm going to take over here just one second. Let me share my screen. I don't know if everyone can hear me. Um, yep. Let me share. We got some great questions here in the Q&A. If you have a question, please feel free to throw it in the Q&A box, um, not the chat box, if you don't mind. So the first question I got um, is from Nia. It asks, for those who obtained degrees after being released, how was it finding funding for school? For example, scholarships and grants. Oh, sorry, it went away, there it is. Um, sorry, one second. Just let me, there it is. Where did you all look for funding and should nonprofits who, is, who assist those impacted by the criminal legal system start creating scholarships for those interested in going back to school? The question here is about finding funding for education programs during and post-release? So I'll answer the, the latter part of that question first by saying, absolutely, foundations that are funding, you know, um, criminal justice uh, or reentry programs, whatever that looks like, or, uh, or foundations that support education, um, I do believe that there should be some type of scholarships that exists for uh, formerly incarcerated people. Um, I, I think, you know, there are a couple of uh, reasons for why they don't exist um, right now. And that's, you know, just from what I'm learning about uh, philanthropy and um, how a lot of the times they want to look for, you know, brand new um, ideas that lead to, you know, uh, logic models and metrics, so on and so forth. You know, the idea of just saying, like, I'm going to commit, you know, 1.5 million over X amount of years to scholarships for people formerly incarcerated going to college. Like, uh, it, I guess that doesn't really, um, you know, attract uh, funders the same way, you know, um, again, a program would that has measurable uh, outcomes, if you will. But um, I would, you know, argue differently that there, there is a lot to measure by offering those scholarships to directly um, impacted people. Uh, there aren't any that I know of that exist. And um, I've been, you know, assisting on uh, college reentry programs for some time now. And uh, I, I normally would recommend to um, students in reentry to just go after those that apply, you know, to them, whether it's based on the program of study um, if it's need based and, you know, you fit like a particular, uh, racial group or GPA, whatever it is, like you have to try to find your way where you can squeeze in. Other than that, you will be hard pressed to find like a scholarship saying like, Hey, have you been in prison? Have you served, served time and now in college apply for this? You, you're not going to find that, but it definitely needs to, um, be in place. Great, thanks so much, Cheryl. Um, our next question is from Mary. Um, and this might, uh, Farouk might be able to answer this question, but please anyone jump in. Do you suppo support or oppose inside out prison education model programs where people are coming in from the outside who have no prison experience to work with people who are in prison? Oh yeah, I definitely support that. Um... Uh, I'm actually an advocate of it. Uh, inside Out programs have done very well. They've not only helped uh, the men in there to, you know, get classes and get credits in a major universities, but it also helps the students that come in. These most of these students are um, are in some kind of criminal justice or uh, sociology or 
you know, those types of uh, majors. And it, it helps give them an idea of the people that they're intending on working with, uh, you know, in their career. And it, it cures some of the beliefs that people have or fix some of the beliefs that people have about, you know, uh, what convicts, people inside of prison, whatever name we like to call them now, uh, what they're about, and lets them see that, you know, they're just other human beings that, you know, somewhere or another got caught up, you know, for the various reasons, uh, you know, and wound up in prison. And a lot of it is from poverty and all the other things, that, you know, we talk about all the time. And so, you know, it helps develop those kind of understandings from both sides. And so, yeah, I'm a very big advocate. Uh, that's why I mentioned that now the cadets from the police academy have to go into the prison and take a course with men in prison because it does the same thing for them. You know, uh, I'm one that believes in, you know, defunding the police myself. And, uh, you know, but I know they'll always have police for some things. But when they begin to see the folks that they arrest in another way, which, you know, inside out helps them do, and then when they become officers, they'll remember those folks. They'll remember them people. And in Inside Out, there's a lot of discussion uh, over topics of justice and uh, topics of mass incarceration, and, you know, and why people do crime. And, you know, so these things are important that they're shared in that kind of environment. And it's so hard to explain what people learn, but you start off afraid or, you know, most folks coming in, a lot of those cadets come in thinking like, I don't even want to be around these convicts. And at the end of the class, they leave as friends. And, uh, you know, I think it's just an important experience for everyone involved and for society. Thanks so much, Brooke. Um, the next question I have is from Jean, who is a tutor here for PD Green in, in Philadelphia. She asks, what kinds of things can we do beyond tutoring to foster systemic change that will result in the abolition of incarceration? Stacy, maybe you want to answer first and then people can join in. Yep, thank you. I think I just um, responded to that. I didn't even realize they, you, you were reading from that one. I'm sorry. I just responded saying, you know, we have a national movement. We belong to, again, everybody can be a member of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. Nationally, we are aiming to end incarceration in women and girls. Families for Justice is Healing in the Boston Roxbury area is also aiming to end incarceration of women and girls. But one of the things that we work with is participatory defense organizing. And what we do there is to assist a family member or themselves, anyone that walks into our community center and needs assistance that's facing the criminal justice system, the injustice of these sentences. We, we're not lawyers. But a lot where most of us are formerly incarcerated and have had our bout with the So we assist that individual or the family on how to really attack or approach their crime or their charge lovingly, caringly, and the whole aim is to save time. Time saved versus time served. And we mean that, and that's another way of ending incarceration of women and girls. And participatory defense organizing comes out of Silicon Valley, California. Debug comes in and trains us. We meet every Tuesday night. We do it by Zoom. And we approach, again, we approach and help the community, families, 
overcome the challenges of going in and out of the prison system. We meet with parole boards. We speak on behalf of the, the individual for release, parole releases. And we also sit in front of legislation and we fight for changes. When Robert talked about defunding, a lot of people don't know what that means. We're talking about these, these organizations, police departments and correctional departments. The DOC has massive amounts of budgets. You almost have one God to one individual in prison. That is so unacceptable. How does anybody think about education or furthering their self in any means of being a human being? We're, we're really talking about defunding some of the budgets. Take some of the police overtime budgets. The Boston police is looking at a massive budget where they want more money to build more prisons and more money to get more cars and more money to have more police officers. Well, you're only policing us in our black and brown communities. There's no other police nowhere else. You're arresting these children, black and brown boys that are carrying a weapon out of fear. Maybe they don't have a weapon at all. Maybe the police are giving it to them. Who knows what the sentences are or the cases are or the reasons why we continue and perpetuate the idea of incarcerating people. Massachusetts is talking about building another $50 million prison for women. We have less than, a, than 180 women or less than 470 women in state, in county, and local jails in Massachusetts. You know what we could do with $50 million? We could build a whole new PD Green Center and have people go and get education and get housing and get them off the street and get them into treatment facilities. We're gonna stop that process. We need educational services. We need treatment facilities. We need more in our communities and to continuously talk about funding. It's about divesting some of that money and investing in its community and education, art centers, and allow our next generation. This young man, Terrell, I don't know where you came from, dude. You're a powerful young man. I'm loving you. Like, you broke some shit down. Excuse my language. But we got our families, our sisters, our, you know, our team, Families for Justice Healing, came on here, and they're loving you, man. We're like, we need you. We need you to keep using your voice. Mr. Robert Wyman, like, it's such an honor to hear you. I'm so glad that you're home. I had no clue that you were home. I read half of your book. I'm going to read the other half. Like, this is what it's about. We need us. Formerly incarcerated people, there's nothing without us. Legislation, all these people who think they know what they're creating and reformists and all that shit, they don't know what they're doing. We know what you should be doing. You should have us at the table every time you speak about us. There's nothing without us or about us without us. And we mean that, and we're gonna keep growing. And I hope, Terrell, I hope in New Jersey, did you say you're in New Jersey, Philadelphia, wherever you are, Robert, I'm sorry, I'm messing up states. I need education in that too. I'm hoping that you all are really hearing the message. We have people from the National Council in those states too. And so we're growing in numbers. There's power in numbers. We're gonna change this stuff and we're gonna keep growing with these educational forums, whether it's music, art, writing, creative, theater. You know, it's all about transforming oneself. We need it, we're not gonna stop at it. And I'm grateful for this platform. So thank you for letting me share that. Thanks so much, Stacey. I have a few people here on the Q&A that are educators, um, that are either teachers, I've worked as, as tutors with PD Green. Um, one of the questions here we have is, what do you believe are the biggest blind spots in the public school system pre-incarceration? Um, and from your perspective, do you have any advice for someone who works in a public school system? And that can be for anyone. Did you say any advice that what works in, in the school system? Are we yeah. talking about the public school system? Sure, yep. Um, anyone who's working in the public school system, yep. So the only advice that I can really offer is to really say to stick with it and hold your ground. Like you really need to, you know, often our teachers are overworked, underpaid, and they're not, they're spending a lot of their own money to educate our children. Boston, in Boston, they just took away the arts. They took funding out of the arts. They probably gave it over there to the Boston police. 
commission. Who knows? And that's unacceptable. And we're saying, how do you expect our children to, or our teachers to educate our students if they're not being paid? Give the money back into the Boston public school system and stop the votes from trying to create charter schools and take away our rights. Because in five to 10 years, if we don't know by now, black and brown people that's on here, even white people that's on here, you need to know that they're really trying to create a system so our black and brown children won't be able to go get any education. So the teachers out there, stand your ground and keep fighting to keep our public schools open and stay educated and keep educating. I know that the teachers, those are our forefront of our life to give us that hope and motivation to want to keep learning and learn something different. We need to keep growing in that. We need to keep talking about these issues because they're taking these funds out of our community. And so that's the advice I'm giving to the teachers. Keep going to get educated, become PhD students, and keep learning how to be effective with our children's lives and keep them motivated and keep them out of the street. It's one way to do it. Thanks, Stacey. Does any other other? Well, I just, I would, Go ahead, Rob. Yeah, I would like to agree. I would like to agree with what she just was saying. Uh, one of the things that we definitely have to do in in defunding the police, and and that doesn't mean like you don't give any funds to, uh, you know, law and order, because you know we're gonna always need that. There's some crazy folks gonna do crazy things sometimes. We're gonna need to get them off the streets and do something. But we can do other things. But one of the things that we do with a lot of that def def defunded money is to send it to the schools where they are needed. Most of all, you know, if we're going to have a better world, then we're going to have to have a better educated populace. And we need to be giving that to the schools, not just for education. I mean, for education, but all the other things, you know, so many kids are going to school hungry. So many kids need all kinds of different counseling, you know, and we need to take some of that money that we are building prisons with. I heard Stacy say that, you know, they're talking about $50 million to build new prisons. If we build new prisons, believe me, they're going to make sure they fill them up with people and they fill them up with more guards, and more counselors and, uh, you know, more people that sit around in offices all day and uh, try to figure out ways to uh, act like they're doing something that's important. Uh, I've seen too many of that, too much of that in prison. So what we really need is to be taking some of that funding and putting it where we need it the most with our children in, in their education. So... And, and the other last thing I want to say about that is we need to take that money also and divide it up equally. You know, I know in Pittsburgh and in Pennsylvania, we have too much uh, money in suburban schools and so much less in urban schools. Uh, you know, we've set up a system where rich communities take more taxes to spend on education on their children where poorer communities don't have as much money to educate them. If we're talking about to educate their children, if we're talking about equality, if we're talking about changing things in America, if we're talking about getting rid of system, systematic racism, one of the things we need to do is take the money that we have for education in the states then divide it up amongst the schools in a more equal way so that that system of continuing racism can be broken by educating our children. And that's something that we can do that is a real concrete step to making a huge change in this country of ours. Thanks so much, Farouk. Okay, so it's 326. We have about three or four minutes left. I want to give everybody time to just kind of sign off. Um, I have one last question. Terrell, do you mind if I kick it to you and we try to answer it in, in, a, brief, in a brief way? Um, and I think it's applicable to a lot of people that are here on this call. What advice do you have for people who are volunteering or working in a prison education setting? I would say... Uh to 
to stick with the work, um, meaning like the area of, you know, justice and um, especially how it relates to the um, carceral setting. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean to stick with the tutoring aspect or having to stick to education specifically. I feel uh, the same way one grows within a career, um, you can also grow within, you know, your, your uh, personal endeavors. Or as it was mentioned earlier, like uh, essentially giving to a cause greater than yourself. Um, that takes on many different uh, facets. And I, I think, you know, for myself, um, I, I too have grown in this space, um, whether it, it was me doing like a lot of direct uh, mentoring, um, then doing like direct services, then moving into policy. Now I'm into, you know, um, philanthropy, but it's all from, from the beginning of me starting college to where I am now, everything I have done has been about like either prison or reentry. And um, again, like a lot of, uh, you know, tutors right now and, and folks that are going into the facilities, you know, this might just be the launching pad, but it's so many other things uh, as you get to learn about, you know, incarceration and just the justice system overall. Um, if you're liberating people, you know, it has to start somewhere. So for those tutors that are going into the facility that are part of PD Green, um, you may not be study studying uh, criminal justice, and I don't think you really should or need to to work in within the prison system because what they teach on college campuses for criminal justice is a very uh, negative, you know, um, approach in how they talk about prisons, police, so on and so forth. So uh, we really need more of the social justice folks studying and then doing this work, you know, once they leave college. So I'll, I'll stop there. Again, hang in there, continue this work, and just understand that, you know, it takes on so many different levels and um, uh, what it looks like to, to achieve justice for, for all people.